Ah, anyways. Yo ho ho, me mateys, and welcome back to the podcast. I'm your co-host, Adrian Grand, here with on my left or on my right. I don't know. You you, either way. Um, okay. Today, a little different. This is obviously not Spencer. I'm obviously with somebody else at the moment. But that's okay. More updates on where Spencer is in the future. All you need to know is that he is not dead. He is healthy, alive, and thriving gaslighting, gatekeeping, and girl bossing his way through the political arena. But besides that, I will let Adrian actually continue the introduction because this is his first time doing the introduction. Coolio. So welcome back to the Glass Half Full podcast. Was that not right? The half hour podcast. The, the, the two and a half men podcast. We're going to work on that. But today we're going to be talking about the Ottawa Truck protests that some of you have probably already seen pop up in the news. But instead of just reading the headline of articles, I figured and we figured that we give you a more in-depth understanding of what's going on in Canada, also bordering the U.S. So it's like a domestic slash international topic, mainly international, I would say. And if we are in a war in the next couple of days, you betcha. Next episode is going to be on Russia and Ukraine. <laughs> All right. So, and before we actually get into everything that we're going to talk about in this podcast, I do want to give an introduction to Adrian. At first, he was going to just be a special guest, but then Spencer ended up getting a really cool job opportunity, well, internship opportunity, and I did not want him to stress out about both this podcast and his job. So, we hired Adrian, and I say hired like he's getting paid, but we don't get compensation, but that's okay. Um, Adrian Graham, cool fellow, went to East High School, was in the same graduating class as me, did speech and debate for all four years. The events that he did was policy debate for all four years of high school, and started doing extemporaneous speaking junior year. So... Well, no, not sophomore year, because you didn't compete that much in extemp sophomore year, so it doesn't count. (laughs) Okay, but technically, I guess, sophomore year, so he has three years of extemp experience, even though it's not four years or all that, he is still a very great extemper. He won state just last year, and basically was one of the most recent East speech and debate extemporaneous speaking champions at state so that's cool and I think he's a great extemper and offers a lot of insight so hopefully you'll enjoy the next couple of episodes with Adrian and I but I was carried by humor hopefully that'll carry us here today too speaking of humor I'm sure you're going to love Adrian's explanation on background I'm gonna hand it off to Adrian and he's gonna tell you what's up with the Ottawa protests All right. So like, let's start with the beginning. So this week we're talking about the glorious soup. Oh my God. I'm so bad at this. Cut this out, Josh. Okay. Anyways, this week we're talking about the glorious syrupy land of Canada who recently had their mass protest. It was sponsored by the Freedom Convoy, which contained a group of mostly truck drivers who just refused to work and wanted to end the cross-border COVID vaccine mandate for all truck drivers. Um, the protest sort of started off like, you know, we just don't like the COVID vaccine and instead turned into a whole hold up the government because we hate Justin Trudeau movement, which is like kind of based and awesome. So I kind of want to focus on the potential capabilities of the Canadian issues to seep into the U.S. Because as you talked about, it's more of like a domestic slash international issue because while it totally does deal with Canada, it's like basically the U.S. So like, you know, what are the extent drop people going to do? Change their minds? Um, So let's start off with like a pretty basic question. Are these protests even going to make their way into the U.S.? And if so, like, what's the extent of it? Um, I think the answer is like a probably yeah. Like the protesters are making their message heard on like 
a global scale. It's not just like within Canada, you have people in the US picking up this issue, like uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, who was like, I'm jumping on that board immediately. Uh, she started by saying that these protests were the greatest thing to happen ever, but it wasn't just like the far right that picked up the movement in the US. It was also sort of like the anti-masker movement who also saw it was a really great idea and gave it a lot more steam. All this support for like the convoy made it so that there was like a massive organization, not only within the US, but also in Canada too. Uh, you could see this on like Facebook groups where they had like over 130,000 people in a Facebook group for the convoy. And then it immediately got shut down by Facebook and uh, people didn't really appreciate that one. So as far as we know, the protest is making its way all the way into the US and it's making it into the US with quite a large impact. I think that it's not only obvious that like it's a big issue in the United States, but also the protests are like already seeping their way out of Canada. As of the 14th of February, I don't know when this comes out, so I guess we'll see. Uh, but as of the 14th of February, we know that the mask organization was already seeing like uh, its, its little tendrils being stuck in like Buffalo in New York. Um, with just like a ton of people in New York with just the hashtag my body, my choice stickers plastered everywhere and their flags flying in the air and it's important because this city and like the border of new york is only like 80 miles away from ottawa the canadian like capital hub where all this is going on and it's kind of proof that even like that close to the border we're already seeing the impacts of this protest on the u.s it's getting a lot uh more serious than i think any of us have ever like imagined it was going to be so you know that's something but also, it's not just in like the US or Canada, it's also going global. Uh, bless up for one of my favorite countries in the entire world, New Zealand. Uh, even they're facing problems from the Canadian convoy, or the con convoy, convoy. Um, because they too are also having like these massive vaccine lockdowns on their country. I think it was like the first like year and a half, New Zealand didn't even have a singular COVID case throughout their entire country. And then just like immediately they went from like a, average 10 a day to like 2000 a day recently and the government just cracked down on them and they are very very unhappy with the uh the government there in new zealand and uh, a lot of it has to do with the spike in these protests showing that people are kind of over the covid mandates and vaccines and everything and they're just kind of wanting that return to normalcy but it's definitely seeping outside of the u.s even into other countries too, like Britain and France, they're also very upset about these things and dealing with the exact same convoy issues that Canada's doing. Yeah, so basically a lot of things have been going on, not just in Canada, but globally. And the next section, my section, what I'm going to talk about is basically just everything that has spiraled out of control. And also the different kind of perspectives that people have on the Canada protests and what it means to them. So. With that being said, let's unpack more about why these protests are happening in the first place. So like Adrian said, the Ottawa and truckers are protesting against the COVID-19 protocols that President Justin Trudeau of Canada put forth. Specifically, they were mostly concerned with the MAC vaccine mandate or the requirement that truckers had to be fully vaccinated when crossing the United States and Canadian border. So it's good to note that not all of the truckers that are protesting are Canadian. Um, many of them are the ones that cross the border into Canada from the U.S., but there are Canadians among this group, too. It's just kind of mixed in together. The truckers are still in Ottawa right now, blocking key paths between Canada and the United States. And protesters agree that they feel unified in their action against these mandates. And so they don't really seem to be leaving anytime soon. But then that calls into the question of like whether the situation will escalate, et cetera, et cetera. But before I get deeper into that issue and the controversy surrounding it, just a reminder to actually get vaccinated if you are able and to check the CDC's website for more information on COVID. We trust the CDC enough to give us accurate information. And we also should trust scientists to give us accurate information about how to deal with diseases and what the population should do so we can get on with our lives, basically. Regardless, as you imagine, there is a lot of backlash that these protesters are getting for their stance against vaccination mandates. The biggest problem that citizens in Ottawa have with these protests is that it's disrupting their lives. So protesters have gotten very aggressive with people walking in the streets, just doing daily tasks. Um, it is generally disruptive on like Ottawan citizens' lives as it's hard to get anywhere by car like citizens normally would do. 
overall, not everybody in Ottawa stands in solidarity with these protesters. They do want Trudeau to do something to get these protesters to disperse. And this is where you see more police action getting involved as a means to de-escalate this, these protests. However, it doesn't seem to be working to de-escalate the situation as it's only fueled protesters' morale to just stay put. Um, while I will say the amount of truckers that are in Canada has decreased from 2,000 trucks to 300 trucks and probably less depending on what the news says now by the time this episode published is published. But the police can't really do as much to disperse them immediately, is what I'll say. On another level, many people are frustrated that there are still protests against vaccine mandates in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, remember that we are not out of the pandemic just yet, and whether we're at the end of this pandemic remains to be seen in hindsight. There are still fluctuations in the amount of COVID cases, and those numbers have not fully decreased to lower levels or steady levels, so we can understand why people are very frustrated at these protests. Some even go to blame the U.S. for being a bad influence on Canada. The reason being is that the right-wing groups within the U.S., including extremist groups, have been giving these protests their support both verbally and financially, like Adrian just mentioned in his section. But another thing I do want to focus on is the fact that the police officers that were sent to deal with the protests did not engage violently. So I say didn't engage violently, meaning that they were not using tear gas or rubber bullets or anything of the sort to de-escalate or get the protesters to leave. Instead, they just started ticketing trucks that were parked in areas blocking the road and arresting the quote unquote leaders of the protesters and some protesters themselves. Trudeau did not want the situation to get violent and in turn did not send that much manpower to deal with the protesters to get them to leave. However, that means that they could not fully disperse the protesters. And so 300 or more trucks or less trucks, depending on when you see this, still remains in the area. But Biden, in response to this, wrote to Trudeau to lift the vaccine mandate for truckers as a way to de-escalate the situation and disperse protesters. But as you can imagine, that was also met with a lot of backlash, as it seems like the U.S. is giving a blank check for this type of behavior. And that's not something that voters who voted for Biden really wanted him to do. So that's why we see a lot of people mad at him for how he's been dealing with the situation. There's also a broader question of why these protests are happening even in the first place, because Canada is not the only place that's ha that has had protests against vaccine mandates and COVID safety mandates in general. For example, along with New Zealand, in the UK, there was and is a group called the Alpha Men Assembly, and I kid you not that this is their actual name, that organize protests against vaccine mandates in schools, public areas, and all that jazz. And this movement has proliferated in other countries like Australia, Canada, and of course, protests in the United States also mirror the same rhetoric. There isn't an exact reason why many of these protests have erupted, just analytically, but analysts do know that many of these protests are basing their grievances on the point of individual freedom and sovereignty. Basically, arguments like the vaccine mandate is infringing on my rights and freedoms as a human being, and so they feel that they have a right to protest against these mandates. Some other scholars will note that these protests have a tinge of white supremacy, and this isn't to say that they do or they don't, but analysts do note that some of the leaders of the protests have had a past of racist actions, such as flying around a Confederate flag or even swastikas. Now, whether this has anything to do with protesting mandates or not is unknown, but it is a common trait and potential motivator for these protesters. As of now, protests haven't dispersed and are still ongoing, but the border between U.S. and Canada and Ottawa is open. And that's about as much as we know about the situation that is going on, which I guess is a perfect like lead to are the questions that we've been talking about for this episode. So just a reminder, these questions are from Exam Central. We have two today. The first one is, how can the Biden administration prevent an Ottawa-like protest in the United States? And like always, let's let Adrian, our guest speaker, go first. Yeah, so I think it's like pretty obvious with like the whole blank check situation going on that Biden doesn't really have like a whole lot of like room to move around on this situation. He can't really like be too like tough on these protesters like all hell will rain loose upon biden if he ever comes out and just calls for them to like completely stop their actions uh like 
the exact people who are going to protest are the ones who didn't like the government lockdowns or like the CDC regulations before. And it's not like they're going to be any happier when like he tells them to stop using their right to protest. It's quite similar to like the January 6th riots and like, uh, you know, like I talked about before, like that shutdown of 130,000 people on like a Facebook group is like very, very parallel to this exact situation. And we could see this transpire into something almost as big as that. But on the like flip side of that, he can't really be too soft on them either. That the left will like blast him for not taking a stand against these anti-vaxxers or like the truckers in general. Um, like he's the Democratic candidate, and like you know, any more hatred thrown his way could implicate things like the midterms at this point, with people are just like desperately wanting to put an end to like Biden's constant attempts to shove through as much legislation as possible. Uh, not making a decision at all could cause people to think that he's like really passive towards these groups and uh, may not be so supportive of the Democrats in the next election and might turn all the flips in the are uh, all the flip seats in the Senate towards Republican. But I think the like obvious response is that if the protests get too big, he's kind of had his hand forced where he doesn't necessarily have to like negotiate with them, but he certainly has to at least talk to them and hear them out. The exact reasons why we saw like the the protests on like January sixth is because nobody's willing to like hear people out on issues the same reason like during the trump administration we saw so much like hostility during like blm was just purely when people are like it's canada there's like nothing happening there like they're pretty peaceful i think it's a good psa to say that that's not true and we see that with like the protests in ottawa and also many people like feeling this kind of sentiment um so it's always good to note that like even though we don't get a lot of news from a particular country that doesn't mean that the country isn't doing anything at all or like their domestic kind of like peace uh doesn't necessarily mean that like it's peaceful but in terms of just answering the question i would probably like mainly agree with adrian that like i don't think justin trudeau handled the protests in a good way like there were definitely some mistakes made it seemed like he was not committed enough to actually do anything to address all of these issues um and the fact that like he took what canada deems as very drastic measures in order to combat the protests and to try to like get everybody to disperse and leave the area it leaves a lot of like mixed feelings in everybody's mouths <laughs> especially in Canada just because like these protests weren't necessarily violent as like no one died no one really got injured that we know of and it wasn't something that was to the extreme where they were like damaging property or like anything like that mainly they were kind of just there to do peaceful protests and like the only thing that was very drastic was some of the protesters harassing people walking on the street but other than that like there's not really an indication that it was a necessary call to enact the emergency call and so Trudeau is getting a lot of heat from that so I do think like answering this question it'll probably be a yes that he did handle the freedom convoy protest poorly and if you don't like any of the analysis that we've just done as to why he handled it very poorly you can go more in depth about the fact that like he wasn't really doing much to try to address the issue or to like come to a resolution with them or to even reinforce the fact that COVID-19 is still something that is very dangerous to a lot of people and not all everyone is like vaccinated so that was also like an important part of trying to address that issue in a better way and the fact that he like went into hiding again is an indication that he did not handle the freedom convoy protests good like in any good way and i think that is also very important to consider especially the fact that like his chances at re-election is going to be hindered because of how he handled this protest should also be an indication as to like why this question like the answer to this question is a yes and so just considering all those factors and stuff like that but if you do want to do like the flip side of that i don't i don't really know how to do like the flip side of that i guess like you could say he was successful in trying to you know disperse the protests and to like calm everything down in ottawa to open the borders again so that you know movement is happening between the two countries as best as it possibly can but 
other than that, I can't really think of like any answers that would support the other side of like, yeah, he or like, no, he did actually handle it okay or as best as he could. Because um, I definitely think that there could could have been more that could be done. I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that, Adrian? If you were to answer no to this question. Yeah, if the question sort of comes down to like, you know, like his re-election chances, I don't know how the Canadian government works. And I don't know if we should have looked into this before, if there even is like a Canadian re-election. But um, even if it's like about his like popularity, maybe you can sort of make the argument that um, like Trudeau has done so much wrong in the past couple of years when like Canada's like a pretty like, you know, like tame country and like have like a whole lot of controversies and like you know like the stereotypical like depiction of them just like hanging out saying a all the time is like probably true and like Trudeau has just done so many things like we talked about the the blackface incidents before like you obviously have this going on right now you have him rolling over to like the Biden administration during like the the keystone pipe removal and just like everybody like his advisors including like the the entire like the citizens of Canada are like furious with him at this point but it's a question of whether or not like the household name of Trudeau will like triumph over all these constant controversies that just continually beat him down and I think that like there's a good chance that the answer is yes but who really knows yeah I guess that's true and I should clarify that I said like president of Canada prime minister of Canada like we should we should clarify that that's my bad um but just know that like usually prime minister and president generally have like the same roles it's just like a different way of government so whereas the president has like a lot of say in like doing well just like what we generally know about the president's power they can like enact legislation they have to do this they have to do that for a prime minister it's mainly his job is like mainly revolved around parliament and getting a majority of parliament, um, which you could say is like generally what the president should do, uh, like in the United States. But we don't always have a majority in everything. But the parliament for the prime minister, it's like their job to kind of gain a majority so that their side has more say in the legislation and the actions that they do. And just like general note I guess like there is an election process there's a re-election process for whether or not Justin Trudeau will still be the prime minister of Canada's parliament um and he did win in the last elections which was in 2021 that is good to know but he did not come out with as big of a majority as he should have for his parliament and his administration so there's that yeah I don't know I think Adrian is right in terms of like saying we don't know if the answer is technically yes or no, but I feel like our analysis and our answers generally lean towards a yes for the question. Yeah. So anyway, I think this is a good way to wrap up the episode. Thank you so much to Adrian for coming and doing episodes with us for the next three weeks. Yeah, How thanks for doing? having me on. I, I feel pretty good, uh, you know. Me and my extent buddies, we're we're out here. We're working to make a change. <laughs> yeah. So, as always, I hope you get the one in the round. But if you don't, let us know how you did. Let us know how we did. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, feel free feel free to DM either me or Spencer, even though he's not doing this podcast right now, or email Adrian. And we're gonna have his email in the video, but. That's only because he doesn't have social media. But anyway, <laughs> feel free to ask him any questions over email or if you see him running around at tournaments, I'm sure he'll be there in mostly Wyoming circuit tournaments. But feel free to just like catch him and ask him any questions. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit the subscribe button and also ring the bell so that you don't miss any new episodes remember that our episodes come out on youtube earlier rather than on the one club podcast so be sure if you want exclusive content or early content to follow our youtube ring the bell subscribe all that jazz follow us on social media at the half hour extent podcast on instagram and on twitter we do polls on there we also let you know when the next episode is coming out and we also tease the next episode that will be coming out so please, if you want any updates, if you have any questions, DM those platforms and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. 
as always, thank you so much for listening. And we will see you next week when people are like, it's Canada. There's like nothing happening there. Like they're pretty peaceful. I think it's a good PSA to say that that's not true. And we see that with like the protests in Ottawa and also many people like feeling this kind of sentiment. Um, So it's always good to note that like, even though we don't get a lot of news from a particular country, that doesn't mean that the country isn't doing anything at all or like their domestic kind of like peace uh, doesn't necessarily mean that like it's peaceful. But in terms of just answering the question, I would probably like mainly agree with Adrian that like, I don't think Justin Trudeau handled the protests in a good way. Like there were definitely some mistakes made. It seemed like he was not committed enough to actually do anything to address all of these issues. Um, And the fact that like he took what Canada deems as very drastic measures in order to combat the protests and to try to like get everybody to disperse and leave the area it leaves a lot of like mixed feelings in everybody's mouths <laughs> especially in Canada just because like these protests weren't necessarily violent as like no one died no one really got injured that we know of and it wasn't something that was to the extreme where they were like damaging property or like anything like that mainly they were kind of just there to do peaceful protests and like the only thing that was very drastic was some of the protesters harassing people walking on the street but other than that like there's not really an indication that it was a necessary call to enact the emergency call and so Trudeau is getting a lot of heat from that so I do think like answering this question it'll probably be a yes that he did handle the freedom convoy protest poorly and if you don't like any of the analysis that we've just done as to why he handled it very poorly you can go more in depth about the fact that like he wasn't really doing much to try to address the issue or to like come to a resolution with them or to even reinforce the fact that COVID-19 is still something that is very dangerous to a lot of people and not all everyone is like vaccinated so that was also like an important part of trying to address that issue in a better way and the fact that he like went into hiding again is an indication that he did not handle the freedom convoy protests good like in any good way and I think that is also very important to consider especially the fact that like his chances at re-election is going to be hindered because of how he handled this protest should also be an indication as to like why this question like the answer to this question is a yes and so just considering all those factors and stuff like that but if you do want to do like the flip side of that I don't I don't really know how to do like the flip side of that I guess like you could say he was successful in trying to you know, disperse the protests and to like calm everything down in Ottawa to open the borders again so that, you know, movement is happening between the two countries as best as it possibly can. But other than that, I can't really think of like any answers that would support the other side of like, yeah, he or like, no, he did actually handle it okay or as best as he could. Um, Because I definitely think that there could, could have been more that could be done. I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that, Adrian? If you were to answer no to this question? Yeah, if the question sort of comes down to like, you know, like his re-election chances, I don't know how the Canadian government works. I don't know if we should have looked into this before, if there even is like a Canadian re-election. But um, even if it's like about his like popularity, maybe you can sort of make the argument that um, like Trudeau has done so much wrong in the past couple of years when like Canada's like a pretty like, you know, like, tame country and like have like a whole lot of controversies and like you know like the stereotypical like depiction of them just like hanging out saying a all the time is like probably true and like Trudeau has just done so many things like we talked about the the blackface incidents before like you obviously have this going on right now you have him rolling over to like the Biden administration during like the the keystone pipe removal and just like everybody like his advisors including like the the entire like the citizens of Canada are like furious with him at this point but it's a question of whether or not like the household name of Trudeau will like triumph over all these constant controversies that just continually beat him down and I think that like 
there's a good chance that the answer is yes, but who really knows? Yeah, I guess that's true. And I should clarify that I said like president of Canada, prime minister of Canada. Like we should we should clarify that. That's my bad. Um, but just know that like usually prime minister and president generally have like the same roles it's just like a different way of government so whereas the president has like a lot of say in like doing well just like what we generally know about the president's power they can like enact legislation they have to do this they have to do that for a prime minister it's mainly his job is like mainly revolved around parliament and getting a majority of parliament um which you could say is like generally what the president should do uh, like in the United States, but we don't always have a majority in everything. But the parliament for the prime minister, it's like their job to kind of gain a majority so that their side has more say in the legislation and the actions that they do. And just like general note, I guess like there is an election process. There's a re-election process for whether or not Justin Trudeau will still be the prime minister of Canada's parliament. Um, and he did win in the last elections, which was in 2021. That is good to know. But he did not come out with as big of a majority as he should have for his parliament and his administration. So there's that. Yeah, I don't know. I think Adrian is right in terms of like saying we don't know if the answer is technically yes or no. But I feel like our analysis in our answers generally lean towards a yes for the question. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I think this is a good way to wrap up the episode. Thank you so much to Adrian for coming and doing episodes with us for the next three weeks. Yeah, How thanks for doing? having me on. I, I feel pretty good. Uh, you know, me and my extent buddies, we're, we're out here. We're working to make a change. <laughs> yeah. So as always, I hope you get the one in the round. But if you don't, let us know how you did. Let us know how we did. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, feel free, feel free to DM either me or Spencer, even though he's not doing this podcast right now, or email Adrian. And we're going to have his email in the video. But that's only because he doesn't have social media. But anyway, <laughs> feel free to ask him any questions over email. Or if you see him running around at tournaments, I'm sure he'll be there and mostly Wyoming circuit tournaments, but feel free to just like catch them and ask them any questions. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, hit the subscribe button and also ring the bell so that you don't miss any new episodes. Remember that our episodes come out on YouTube earlier rather than on the One Club podcast. So be sure if you want exclusive content or early content to follow our YouTube, ring the bell, subscribe, all that jazz. Follow us on social media at the Half Hour Extent Podcast on Instagram and on Twitter. We do polls on there. We also let you know when the next episode is coming out. And we also tease the next episode that will be coming out. So please, if you want any updates, if you have any questions, DM those platforms and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. As always, thank you so much for listening and we will see you next week.